research starts because of uh, observations of particular practices or implications of particular policies, and then research is conducted to look at how effective these may be or how problematic they may be, and then the reverse. In some cases, we actually look at the policy and the practice, and then we go and look at how, in fact, they have uh, affected practice and policy. So it's kind of a cyclical um, process. We've got three people who will be speaking today. Um, I've got them in alphabetical order, but we'll not necessarily be speaking in that order. Um, <laughs> and I, but I just want to keep you on your toes. It is after lunch, so you have to keep on your toes. Um, the first is George Bunch. Um, he's an associate professor and faculty director of teacher uh, education at UC Santa Cruz, and he said he only has one more month or so <laughs> in that second position. And uh, we also want to thank George because m many of the volunteers at the conference have been George's students, and we really appreciate all they've done. Please just give him a hand. <laughs> and George recently received a mid-career grant from the Spencer Foundation for 2017-18. Is he okay? Is he okay? Okay, um, and in addition, at this year's AERA, the American Educational Research Association, he was given a mid-career um, award from the Second Language Research SIG. So George is one of the, our three panelists. <laughs> Eugene Garcia, who in fact will be our first speaker. Um, Jean is Professor Emeritus of Education at Arizona State University, and he has so many positions. We didn't put them all up there, but I'm going to give you some of them. Um, he was Director of the Office of Bilingual Education and Minority Languages Affairs, OBEMLA, really critically important. It's now called OELA, unfortunately, <laughs> but it's um, one of the most important parts of the D Department of Education in the U.S. He also um, was Dean of the College of Education at UC Berkeley and with Professor of Education and Psychology closer to home with George at UC Santa Cruz. And our third and last speaker would be Terrence Wiley. Um, Terry is the immediate past president of the Center for Applied Linguistics and he was also a special professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning Policy and Leadership at the University of Maryland College Park, a different branch of Maryland than, than where I'm from. He's also Professor Emeritus at Arizona State University, where he was Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Director of Ed Leadership and Policy. So we've got three very distinguished researchers who all have held incredibly important uh, positions and administrative positions, which puts them in a position to actually look at policy and practice in very close. Um, what we're going to ask is, they will each have about 20 minutes to speak, and we're going to hold all the questions until the end so that we can make sure that the questions are addressed to all three. So without any ado, <laughs> here, um, before I ruin this, aha, <laughs> okay, Gene. Muy buenas tardes. <laughs> Se habla español en California todavía, yeah. Welcome to California, all of you. Uh, those from California know that there are a lot of Spanish spoken in the state, so I was pleased to spend a lot of my career in the state. Uh, we have a little bit of a logic to this presentation. My, my role to some degree is to lay out the science of uh, language learning, especially multiple language learning, uh, and essentially follow with issues that relate to uh, policy and practice and, of course, research. Uh, but primero, uh, thanks to TERF and TESOL for invitation and generating this kind of symposium. I think it's very, very important to develop that uh, sustainable research community uh, in this arena. So th thanks very much. Of course, thanks to Jody for putting the panel together and Sarah and all her uh, TESOL and other colleagues who actually made the logistics uh, uh, for this event. Uh, my role, again, is to try to cover uh, the science. Uh, and I'll do that essentially by looking at a recent report by the National Academy of Science in which I was a panel member of that point. It's called uh, uh, Promoting Educational Success of Children and Youth Learning English, Promising Futures. Uh, later I'll tell you where that's available, but it is a synthesis of research, uh, particularly related to the United States, but cognizant of global research related to multiple language learning in and out of educational settings. So it's very important to, to understand that. So again, if we're going to know, if we're going to sort of move forward on a research agenda, probably a good idea to know what we already know uh, from research and the science.
Uh, in addition, I'm going to focus on the early uh, learning aspects of this because that's essentially what I do. Uh, and so you'll have to forgive me for not going into the entire aspects of this report. Uh, what does the report address? It does try to deal with uh, demographics, language development, policies uh, related to this population, uh, specific uh, populations relating to disabilities and gifted and talented, indigenous heritage learners of languages other than English in the United States. So it tries to be very comprehensive, trying to deal with all aspects of the experience of children and students learning language uh, English in the United States when their primary language is not uh, English. Uh, we have terminology that's important. From zero to five, we like to think of those children as dual language learners. We go into that explanation, that report, but we understand that young children are being exposed to two languages or more, are really acquiring those, maybe differently based on the kinds of input, the kind of use, but it's very important to distinguish those individuals and those kids from those that go into a public setting that we call school and are learning English as a second language in that setting. Uh, who are these DLLs and ELs? That's how we identified them. Uh, as you can see in the, the, the early years, uh, they're, they're essentially born in the United States. They're not immigrants. Even in the later years, uh, over half of them are not immigrant children or students. We get involved extensively in this country uh, acknowledging that these kids exist to some degree, but they must be immigrants. Uh, they're not, uh, they're especially, especially at the younger ages. Important distinction that research tells us is that essentially these children who are five and six years of age are going to march through that system uh, that is essentially uh, many times recognizes them as immigrant students. Uh, they're not. Uh, what kind of languages do they speak? This is just the top 10 languages. 72% of children, at least in the United States, who are identified as dual language or English learners uh, essentially are Spanish speakers. Se habla español en este, en este estado, en esta nación. Uh, so you can see that this, but there are certainly other languages. This is the top 10%, uh, 10 but there are another 150 or so languages that exist in the United States alone. So uh, th that other uh, population of 10% is quite uh, sort of not as clear as it should be because there are a lot of languages that fit in that 10%. Uh, they live in every state, uh, but there are some states in which there are uh, accumulations of over 200% in the last decade. Those are the light blue, the dark blue are the traditional states in the United States where there are these, this population of children and students. But the light blue indicates that there, that growth of 200% or more has spread throughout the United States. So it's very unlikely, I'd say as a dean of a school of education, it's very unlikely anywhere in this country if you're going to teach in a public school and now in a charter school and maybe even in a private school, you're probably going to have one of these students, if not more. So it's not an isolated uh, 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 event to essentially be charged with instructing or taking care of a child who does not speak English. Uh, what are some basic findings of the science? Uh, now the report is some 700 pages long, so I'm going to, you can see I'm going to truncate that a lot in this presentation. <laughs> First of all, from a psycholinguistic, linguistic, language learning development perspective, all children have the capacity to learn two or more languages. Nothing inherent in the brain or in the social dynamics of, of children that they cannot learn more than two languages. In fact, uh, strong, uh, uh, all children have not only the capacity, but learning two languages is now associated essentially with improved cognitive development and cognition improved executive functioning. If you're a child development person like myself, someone who can organize their thoughts, organize their behavior, very sincere notions that children who are learning more than one language are challenged by that, but that challenge essentially generates some executive function positives. In addition to that, there are social, socio-emotional development uh, positives that come out of those children who are learning two languages. A nice scientific notion that disputes there's a mythology that, gee, learning two languages must be really hard, particularly when you're young. Uh, we know that's not true. Uh, can it be done? Does it tax the brain? No, it actually helps the brain. So these are important things that the science over the last two decades has essentially uh, brought fo forward. And any research agenda, anything we do from here on needs to understand essentially that science, that set of research. 
uh, promising practice in early care. Now, how do we translate that notion of we all have the capacity to handle two languages to uh, the ways in which we influence practice? I'll get to policy in a minute, but practice. Certainly, uh, early proficiency in L1, English kindergarten, is critical to becoming proficient in a second language. The science essentially says pay attention to L1. Whatever L2 is, pay attention to L1. I think for many years we were saying, well, okay, L1 is important, but L2 is really important. If we really want someone to learn English particularly, or the majority language in other countries, we really have to pay attention to that. If you don't teach it, uh, they won't learn it. Well, what we know now is that L1 is critical, critical in the development of that first language is critical to the development of English, particularly at least in the United States. So that now we have a fairly good body of literature that says if you're going to address early care, early learning, or K-12 or above learning, you need to pay attention to what's going on to that, that individual student or child in the L1 circumstance. I think that's relatively new and important in understanding the new science. Promising practices in early, early care, it's not something that is also translates into the K-12 sector, but support L1 and in reading, inviting guests, any ways that you can support that, that uh, primary language. Uh, create and access books in L1, something that preschool teachers, Head Start Now, beginning to do that. Create language-rich environments, don't down don't dumb down the language, whether it's English or the native language. Uh, certainly there's interaction here with poverty and other variables and circumstances that children are involved in or engaged in or live in, uh, but don't, don't dumb down that language rich environment that you can provide. Clearly inform families of classroom practices are really important in the early years where families or many families, at least in the United States, may be sending children to school for the first time. What is it like? What is, the, what is going on at that place called school? Be sure essentially to do that while supporting the notion that those families and those homes speak and develop that first language. That's what they're good at. Let's let them continue to do that and do it well. And highlight essentially in those early years the connections between L1 and L2. Uh, family engagement. This is relatively new in this science. If you're going to work with children who come to you do not speak English, and your goal is to move them on a path of English development, certainly paying attention to their primary language or, or L1 is important, but also it essentially to engage family members in the process of understanding language development, not in a pejorative way. Well, this is what you should do to do this, no, but in a way that is respectful of how those families and communities use language and essentially building on those assets, those resources that already exist. Very clearly important is that we are not alone, particularly in the early years, in developing language and developing learning context, but it goes certainly outside the place that we call school, in this case, preschool or early care. Uh, outreach is part important. Lots of times we don't engage families and communities and importance of early learning. One of the report, one of the final uh, uh, outcomes and results of the report is that early learning, preschool particularly, age three and four, enhances English learning in later grades and academic proficiency in later grades. So early learning for this population, particularly preschool, is important. That data comes from not only places like California with the Transitional K evaluation, which was just published about two months ago, but also from states like Oklahoma, New Mexico, Oregon, and New Jersey. So throughout the United States, children who are dual language learners who are participating in preschool programs that build on the resources of their language and the culture actually provide better outcomes for those kids when we measure those outcomes in academic terms, in academic terms. Very important. So outreach and participation in ECE program is critical for this population. The report essentially concludes uh, English focused, obsolete. Okay, like, like driving a 53 Studebaker, okay? Nonsense, Don't, forget it. It'll still, it'll still run, but it won't run very well as a brand new computer driven uh, whatever, uh, Google has printed. Bilingual dual language preferred. There are circumstances, as the report points out, where it's difficult to do dual language. All right, but in any case, a bilingual dual language preferred program is certainly seeming 
from the science perspective, to be, produce much better results for those children and those populations than an English-focused only kind of program. So that's essentially what the research says. Overall, uh, school district and school uh, engagement, some of the things that you already know from other scientific studies, uh, good evaluation studies, uh, set high expectations, invest in teacher collaboration, professional development, those teachers and professionals need uh, support, develop coherent instructional programs, pre-K now through 12, not K-12, pre-K through 12, uh, attend needs uh, struggling, who are struggling, this much like any other population, when these students are struggling, uh, they need particular kinds of attention and support. Uh, engage the families and communities, as I mentioned earlier. Provide the social and emotional support for teachers and students. Why was that important? Because in the United States, we find much of our uh, DL and DLL and EL population is living in immigrant circumstances. Even though they may not be immigrants, they are living in immigrant circumstances. That requires a different way to think about interacting with those families and those communities. And clearly, we don't ignore administrative leadership. The role of the principal, the director, et cetera, is critical in understanding how you deal with all the rest of these, uh, these circles. So uh, science seems to support this kind of, of uh, conclusion. On a policy side, we have ESSA now, ESSA, we say in Spanish, <laughs> ESSA, in, uh, in, in the United States now. It's the reauthorization of ESEA, the equity efforts in the, in the country, which is partly aimed at uh, dual language learners and ELs. Each state now has its own policies. It's particularly important in the human resource area and teacher development, but it's also important in areas of assessment and so forth. The shift from a national perspective to a local state perspective is going to be important in terms of, of the implications of policy. All we're suggesting in this report is that take into account the science as states and local uh, entities deal with the new ESSA requirements, which are essentially going to be pushed down to states, and very likely states push right down to the local school districts, or even the preschools, as noted. Uh, related conclusions, basically, uh, of the report, acquisition of, of two languages, particularly young children, is there are no inherent uh, social, linguistic disadvantages, and possibly positive ones in these domains. Uh, development of, of multiple languages is critically important in understanding the development. The, you know, somebody says, well, good instruction is good instruction. I don't care if they're dual language learners. Nope, you have to pay attention to the fact that they are cooperating in two languages or more. And that's essentially important. Lastly, the educational policies, as I think Terry will point out, play a critical role in how these kids essentially uh, are engaged in the learning process in the United States from early care, preschool, all the way through uh, the K-12 and beyond, post-secondary as well. So we do have to pay attention to the policies uh, uh, related to the science, which is then related to the practice. So that is important. How do you access the re this report? Uh, at the National Academy's website, uh, you can go on there, you, get it, you can download this report free of charge, uh, or you can buy hard copy. I'd be fine with the National Academies. Uh, but in any case, it is an attempt to synthesize essentially what we know at the moment around issues of multiple language development and learning and schooling of these students in the United States, again, with an idea that what we've drawn on is research directly in the U.S. as well as that research globally to inform essentially the kind of research that needs to be done, the kinds of practices that we should consider, and the kinds of policies that are important. Thank you. Thank you. Right on. Thank you. Good afternoon. I got to calibrate the volume here, I guess, a little. Um, good to see you all back for the grand finale. Um, thank you to TESOL and TERF and, and all the organizers and Jody for the invitation for this panel. It's really been fascinating getting to know everyone and hearing the wide range of backgrounds that people have and are working on. Um, I'm presenting a case study, uh, not a research case study, a case study of a project, of an organization, an initiative, 
Um, and as I was thinking about this, and I was, as I was meeting all of you all the last few days, in, in teacher education, um, there's a movement to use cases as, a, as an act of teacher education. And what you do is you present a relatively elaborated, complex case of teaching and learning of some sort. And then you ask the teachers, what is this a case of? You don't tell them what this is a case of, because there's not only one answer. It's a, it's a case that's complex enough for there to be multiple answers. And as I was thinking about this session and this audience, I was thinking that this is what I'm going to do. I'm not telling you what this is a case of, because this is a case of something very different for different ones of you. So I'd invite you to think as I'm talking about what is this a case of for you, either individually with where you are in your career, your engagement with research, uh, what is this a case of maybe institutionally? We started the session with TESOL and TERF as institutions and institutional goals around research. So that's an open invitation and maybe we can follow that up at the breakout session or in, in the questions and answers. Um, I'm a researcher at a Research One University, so that's how I approach this. But again, I think there's many different kinds of stories that are present in here. Um, the Understanding Language Initiative was an initiative that was begun by Kinji Hakuta and a number of us, researchers, policy experts, educational leaders from across the country who were concerned about and interested in maximizing the opportunities for English learners in the Common Core Standards. Um, and I'll talk a little more about the standards themselves in a minute. These are pre-K through 12 standards that many states have adopted. Um, and there's many things we were worried about with the K through 12 Common Core Standards movements when we thought about English language learners, but there were also opportunities we saw. So we took the stance of trying to use this as a moment to accentuate opportunities and get people to rethink some of the historical practices around English learner education in the United States. So a short bit, bit of history with thanks to Kenji who provided these slides and, and just the first few historical slides. Um, and I'll be brief, but there's really, in the, some of you are in international context, unlike countries around the world where the national government runs the education system, as most of you know, that doesn't happen in the US. In the US, uh, states are the predominant movers of, of public education. However, there are two important and very direct ways the federal government plays a role. One is through the enforcement of civil rights and the other is through funding and trying to get states and districts to do what the federal government wants them to do by offering them funding. So this, the, the rights mechanism comes predominantly from the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The money began in, in earnest in 1965 with the Elementary and Secondary Schools Act. So when Jean talked about ESSA, or ESSA, um, that is the latest incantation of this act, as was No Child Left Behind, the previous incantation. These are all the same thing as the Elementary and Secondary Schools Act, which is where the money came from. And I'm trying to be quick, but I just have to tell you that this is Lyndon B. Johnson's kindergarten teacher sitting next to him when he rolled out the, uh, the original um, Secondary uh, Education Act. Elementary and secondary. So for our purposes, crucial, back to the right side, is Lau versus Nichols, which many of you know is, uh, was fought on behalf of Kenny Lau, whose family said he's not getting an equal education because he has no access to the curriculum because it's all in a language that he doesn't speak. The court ended up ruling based on the Civil Rights Act of 1965, not on the Constitution, which they could have ruled on also, that indeed schools have to do something to meet the needs of English learners in the United States. And the court said there is no equality of treatment by providing just equal textbooks and uh, the rest of it if it's in a language that students can't understand. Um, and they said to, to make this argument that you already have to have the, the resources to engage in public education before you get to public education is to make, and this is the Supreme Court's ruling, is to make a mockery of public education. Now they didn't say what to do, and this has been the debate since then. They didn't say bilingual ed, some sort of special English intervention, but they said you have to do something. Um, fast forward a little bit to a nation at risk, uh, uh, some might say bomb bombastic, although beautifully written from sort of rhetorical perspective, call to um, the pu public about the detrimental state of US public education, and we've had these throughout the years, um, which led to, Bill Clinton is here because he was very involved with the standards movement from actually when he was governor and leading the Governor's Association and then again as president, in this great trade-off, which was fashion that the federal government would leave states alone to continue to run their state public school systems in the way they wanted, as long as they raised standards and had accountability measures 
to measure them. And the federal government would force states to have standards and to measure them for accountability, but would leave it up to the states what those standards were. This became sort of nationalized and more pronounced um, uh, with George W. Bush, although look who's in the picture. This was a bipartisan, many people forget, this was a bipartisan uh, passage of No Child Left Behind, which again did this. States created their own standards and testing, but they had to show annual various metrics of progress, which statisticians told us from the very beginning were impossible to reach by the time that the law said they had to be reached. Um, for English learners, the key here was that English learners had to be included in these accountability schemes. So no longer could you say, well, we're, we're doing what we need to do for all students except English learners. So this was sort of the, the silver lining in a very problematic act is that people started paying attention to English learners. States and schools and districts had to test, very problematically test, but at least be thinking about, about the education of English learners. And that the English learning proficiency measures and the instruction had to be somehow aligned with academic work. You couldn't just say that you're teaching English in one side of the house and not connect that at all to the academic uh, work that students needed to be doing. And then the Common Core came. So now this was the tidal wave um, for, for many of us in any aspect of K through 12, pre-K through 12 education. Thank you, Gene, for that reminder. Um, but it, it didn't get rid of No Child Left Behind. It was just the standards that many states adopted with the federal government using their power of money to threaten and to persuade many states to adopt the Common Core. But it was just going to be a more common set of standards because in the old, in the old system, states could have any standards they wanted and they were measured on how many students were meeting them. So you could have very low standards and come out looking very good or you could have, like we had in California, very high standards and come out looking very bad. And so this was an, this was an effort not by the federal government except by persuasion, but um, rising up supposedly from the states, the National Governance Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers to say let's have a common set of standards that we can at least compare and contrast across states. Well obviously for English learners these have huge implications. They raise the bar for learning, they raise the demand for language, and they call for a higher level of classroom discourse across all subject areas. For a population that we're concerned about in this symposium that was already struggling with all of this before and an incredible set of opportunities for rethinking how we might think about language instruction in schools if these are the goals. So we, we're agnostic as, an, as, an, as the understanding of language initiative about whether the Common Core standards were good or bad. I mean, we weren't agnostic personally, but as, a, as an initiative, as our work, that's not what we were engaged in. We were engaged in how can we leverage this moment to improve education for English learners and to raise all of the questions that needed to be raised about the challenges. So this is just the English language arts standards which include disciplinary literacy. So these are the kinds of things that the Common Core standards call upon students to do. And you can imagine as you read them both the challenges for students in the process of learning English, which by the way, as you know, has a huge range from brand new uh, newcomer immigrant students to students who have been in the US for years and are still classified as English learners. Incredible challenges to do these things and incredible opportunities to think about these as a foundation for the goals of English language instruction in public schools in the United States as opposed to some of the more traditional ESL approaches that had been used which were really focused exclusively on grammatical feature acquisition and that sort of thing. Uh, science standards came along as well, not officially part of the Common Core, but a separate movement, uh, but also adopted by now by many states. And if you look at this, the key is this top left quadrant. This right quadrant is what I call knowing stuff about stuff. This is what the standards used to be. Know a bunch of science and take standardized tests to say you've learned a bunch of science stuff. It's the practices that are new in the science standards. Things like asking questions, defining problems, developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations. You can think about the language implications, obviously, for those challenges and opportunities for English learners in thinking about how we're working to develop their, their um, language. Mathematics as well. Now it's not just getting the right answer, it's also explaining your reasoning, uh, advancing arguments, um, solving problems, which um, take language to do. So the old paradigm, 
these come from Kinji as well, is we had content and language and we knew they intersected, but the intersection was often talked about as vocabulary and grammar. What are the key terms of a certain subject area and maybe some grammatical features that might be important. We're moving toward now with the common core standards, thinking more about discourse, explanation, argument, purpose. What are you using language for in order to engage in content? And of course, if you think about the three major content areas that are implicated by the standards, you have all kinds of interesting overlapping relationships, although, you know, acknowledging you do these things differently in different subject areas, but you can still talk about argument across and how argument might look differently in, in, these, in these various areas. So students are challenged to do these kinds of things in common core classrooms, similar to the theme I've been, I've been talking about the last few minutes. Um, so what's the initiative? So I have mentioned this is a group of people from all around the country who's housed at, at Stanford University. Kenji got funding from the Carnegie and Gates Foundations. Um, who were heavily implicated in the creation of the Common Core Standards themselves, so I acknowledge that up front. They had an interest in making the Common Core Standards work for English learners, and Kinji had an interest in using their money to try to improve the education of English learners in this context. And the initial goal was just to get people talking about these things. We really didn't know what the heck we were doing. I, I got a call from Kenji on my cell phone. He said, yeah, I have this idea for this. We didn't know what it was gonna be called. I had just gotten tenure. And you know, before tenure, you're told don't do anything you know that's actual practical or makes a difference. You know, you just, I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but, but you know, it's like I have tenure now, I can do what I want to do. This is this is important. This is going to be so. But we didn't know what we were doing. We got people together, and guess what we did? What do academics do as their first act? We wrote papers, <laughs> right? But we wrote papers that could only been t be ten pages long, and this was very strict rule. Um, because we wanted to have these papers be geared toward policy and practitioner audiences. And um, we put them on the web. We did videos of them, short videos. We had a conference. Uh, the videos are like two to three minutes, I think. And um, people pictured, you might recognize Lily Wong Fillmore. Charles Fillmore was an author before he passed. Leo Van Leer was a co-author of one of the papers before he passed. Guadalupe Valdez was an author of a paper. Um, so these were, these were the top-notch researchers, uh, scholars, writing about a practical and policy-related area in a way as best we could in a short period of time that would be usable by people thinking about these issues in, in the real world. And then they're on, they're on the web, so I don't know how to judge web hits, but you know, Lily Wong Fillmore's has 17,000 views, you know, mine is a little lower at 4,000. I can tell you I haven't had 4,000 people probably even read, certainly not cite any of my academic papers, right? So it was something that was designed from the beginning to be accessible to a large number of people. The Carnegie people never thought it was enough. They were never happy with the, the numbers of hits, but as academics, we were pretty proud of reaching, of reaching this many people. The website has over a million hits itself, the understanding language. I don't know if you know, TESOL can probably tell us whether those metrics are, are good or not, but um, so here's an example. Uh, I'm just going to grab my water. This is the paper that I wrote with several colleagues, actually including Susan Pimentel, who was one of the co-authors of the English Language Arts Standards. The English Language Arts Standards are problematic in many ways, um, but we worked with Susan to think about implications for English language learners. So this is the kind of thing we drew on research and theory to argue, that English learners should not be removed from the challenges set on the standards, but rather supported in meeting them that English learners can meaningfully participate in instruction through imperfect language. You don't have to go somewhere else to be, get your language perfect before you start engaging in the kinds of things that the Common Core Standards call for. That instructions, instruction must build on and build students' existing resources. That's some of the things that Jean was talking about. First language, background knowledge, interest, motivation, precisely in order to expand all those, not to keep students in those, you know, things they're bringing with them, but to expand them. And that in this immersion into meaning-making language and literacy activities has to also have support at both the micro level, inter, in, in the interpersonal interaction between students and between teachers and students, as well as how instruction is structured to provide support. Um, so uh, the second thing that we did is we realized we have these wonderful papers and we all did our two-minute videos and we were going around. I went to, I think, every county office of ed in the state of, in the Northern California. I mean, we were getting this work, but we realized it does, it's not really meaningful unless teachers can see what it looks like. So we commissioned Aida Walkie and West Ed to develop a unit for the English language arts um, 
approach that actually shows what this might look like in practice. And so we did a seventh grade, you always, in, in the K through 12, you always choose middle school because you hope the elementary can sort of see themselves in it, at least at the upper grades, and the high school can sort of see themselves. So it's a seventh grade, great. Created an entire six week unit, freely available on the web for any teacher, school district person, you all, anyone who wants to download the entire thing with all the student handouts, the um, teacher's guide, everything you might need to know. Um, but it wasn't about this instructional unit. It wasn't about, here, go do it. It was about what the unit represented. So we embed with this, with the unit, the kinds of shifts that we're arguing, based on research and theory, need to happen to rethink instruction for English learners. Things like moving from thinking about language acquisition as an individual, linear process toward thinking about it as a complex social process that requires, actually, the kind of interaction that the Common Core Standards is calling for. Right? That's where the challenge and the opportunity has those sort of interacting features. And th this, this is the, the, the shifts are twice as long as this. I'm not going to show all of them to you. But the interesting thing, I'll get to this in a minute, the California State ELD standards, which needed to be revised based on the new legislation and the new standards, actually use this list in their official documents when they were rolling out the, so we're trying to talk about sort of specific kinds of intersections between research, theory, practice, and policy. Um, this is the spiral unit we talked about. You can't just, it's not just a list of instructional strategies. You actually have to show how these things come together in an entire unit that builds on each other, that starts where students are and builds toward more and more complex texts. I don't have time to get into it, but I'd be happy to talk more about it at another point. Um, the lessons themselves have a specific architecture that have activities for preparing learners, building on background knowledge. Interacting with text in multiple kinds of engaging ways and then extending understanding. And it's all laid out in the unit exactly the kinds of activities you can do with this. Um, and we did it. We piloted it in three major urban school districts across the U.S. Um, Heather Schlamann sitting in the back, one of our graduate students who helped with this research. Uh, the idea was not, this is fast stuff. Right? This is trying to do this quickly enough to get it out to people so that they pay attention to it. So this was not a full-blown research pilot. This, is not, this would not have been an example in the morning session right, of how to do a research question and find the approach. This was, OK, what does this look like? Now we got to see, that, will this work? Can we, show, can we convince people this is even possible, this kind of more rigorous interaction with the kinds of supports we're talking about? And these are the reports from what teachers, much to their surprise, teachers said, I never thought my students could read the Gettysburg address, right? But now I'm noticing with the appropriate kind of instructional support, these are the kinds of things that they saw their students able to do. Um, I'm going to skip the quote for time, but um, we'll, it'll be on there. This is what one teacher had to say. Um, and then this again are the metrics. So the unit itself um, was um, downloaded over 137,000 times, um, 96,000 different people downloaded it. So we would run into people at conferences and say, oh yeah, I taught the unit. You know, did they, they just found on their own, all the way from that kind of individual impact to the entire state of North Carolina adopted this unit as the anchor for their professional development for all of their mainstream English language arts teachers in the state to think about working with English learners. Because it was there, because it was accessible, because it had Kinji's and Stanford's name, and, it was, and because we had thought about it, actually, ironically, not as a long-term research project, but rather as something we could do with researchers and scholars as quickly and effectively as possible to get this word out. Um, teacher preparation and, and professional development, obviously. You can't do all this just by handing out the materials. So we another paper. This one actually, this is the, the flip side of the relationship now. This is a paper I wrote. Actually, it, I only, it came out in 2013, and it's, the, it's a paper that's been cited more than any of my other work. And I wrote it based on a PowerPoint presentation to the California State Department of Education that we did as under, we all went, we took a van and picked up all of our people in California on the way to go to Sacramento, all of our, our scholars and researchers, and we did a whole day workshop for the California State Department of Education staff as they thought about how to think about English learners in new standards and new assessments and the rest. And so I threw together a PowerPoint 
thing, not quite in the van, but like the night before on what do we know. And then I developed I develop that then into a full-blown research review. So this is the flip side now, is using the policy question then to inform research. So it does work. I, I wanted to do some sort of matrix, but I'm not good at that kind of thing, especially on PowerPoint. But it would be multidirectional. And MOOCs. I haven't been involved in the MOOCs. How many of you know what a MOOC is? All right, all of you almost. M massive online open courses. These are for teachers. Um, and they are done by Stanford, and they have, they have 13 or 15 of them. Again, sometimes entire state departments of education using them, sometimes small, uh, enrolling in them, sometimes smaller groups, sometimes individual teachers, actually all around the world, not just in the US. And again, here's the metrics. Um, so 50,000 people in the last three years or so have taken these, um, to have taken these MOOCs that came out of the Understanding Language Initiative that are talking, they, the, the lines get not extremely clear because new people come on, so not all of these are official Understanding Language Initiatives, but they're all related to the same family of activities. And back to federal and state policy. So remember, we were trying to think about what are the opportunities and the educative work we could do based on, the com based on this policy that we really had nothing to do with, but then it flips back to policy itself. So given this work that we had done, um, a report came out written by many of the understanding language people that was a framework for every state in the country to think about in rewriting their standards um, and their assessments. And this was published by the chief state schools. I mean, this is mainstream stuff. This is the, the Council of Chief State Schools Officers, their own report coming out written by all of these understanding language researchers saying this is what we know about language, this is what we know about learning and the intersection of the two. You, when you develop state standards, you need to be paying attention to these principles. And then California did that actually and, and they were based in part, not perfectly, and I can tell you stories when we're offline about some of the tensions and the negotiations there, but we had an impact on the California state ELD standards uh, I'll talk more about that later if you want to. ELPA 21, which is a coalition of other states developing standards, very closely used the framework that came out of the initiative to develop their standards and, and I mean, they're developing um, assessments to go with state standards. Now we have ESSA and um, again, being able to get reports out immediately as uh, the shift here is from Title four, Title three, which which just focuses on bilingual and English learners issues. Now to Title one. So Kenji talked about every single State Department education. The top people now are calling him, and he's been going around to every one of them as they think about all these things. Because now it's big time. Now it's every Title one is the main pot of federal money that that states get from federal government. So so, but we couldn't have done gotten there without the infrastructure. So. Um, this is my last slide. So what's this a case of? You can decide, a couple quick reflections. This is not about what one person can do alone, obviously. It's not even about one in, what one institution can do alone. It's nice that TESOL and TERF are already, you know, sort of a closely related and, and working in coalition. It helps to have funding. It also raises dilemmas and issues, right? About certainly accusations of sort of being in the neoliberal movement talking about common core standards funded by Gates and Carnegie. I, I never felt in any individual kind of time where the work was compromised, but it's certainly something to acknowledge and problematize. Uh, the pros and cons of moving quickly, right? As I said, this violates much of the process that we were talking about this morning of thoughtful work over time, but we also, yesterday someone brought up the, was it the shelf, not the shelf life, the shelf time from, from knowledge to implementation. We were talking like, a year or two or three that we were doing this work from getting scholars together to impacting state uh, standards and assessments. So you, you have to make compromises to do that. One of the compromises you have to make is what policy space can you operate in? So we, although we always emphasize the value of L1, of, of um, starting with home language, most of our materials are English-based. That was the policy and practice space that we were in and that we operated in. Was that the right thing to do or not? Should we have gone more boldly into translanguaging and into, uh, who, who knows? But this was, this was the, a political and a policy sort of decision, not to ignore it, but where we're gonna put our in emphasis. Um, it's time consuming for individuals. Um, you need to carve out your own intellectual spaces it's exhilarating and ex exhausting simultaneously, but it helps to recalibrate, and this is what I'll leave you with, 
why we, I mean me personally and all of us, why did we enter the profession to begin with and what does it mean to make a difference? And for, for me, it was moving from the research world into more practice and policy. For some of you, it might actually be the reverse, is challenging yourself to move out a little bit, and you already are doing that for being here, from the classroom teacher mode toward thinking about what's the relationship of your work with these larger issues. So thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, I'm going to shift focus uh, just a little bit and talk about uh, work that uh, was done with doctoral students, uh, primarily in Arizona. But first, I want to thank uh, Kathy, uh, Turf, TESOL, Sarah, uh, and Jody uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I was in California during the, the period where we had one proposition after another. Uh, and they just kept getting like worse. Uh, and then Proposition 227 came along and uh, essentially undercut uh, things that we'd been doing in education for years. And uh, so we had restriction on bilingual education, we had class size reduction, uh, and uh, then we had the rise of the phonics movement, the end of whole language. And uh, so anywhere we turned in our curriculum, uh, it was essentially being dismantled uh, and then I went to Arizona and encountered Proposition two, uh, 203. So uh, that's kind of the quick uh, background context for this. But uh, at Arizona State, um, I did a lot of work with doctoral students, both domestic and international. And uh, language was often the focus, either English language policies in Arizona for education or uh, heritage language work. And one of the things that we used as a kind of basis for what we did was uh, a lot of field experience and engagement in the community. So uh, if we think back uh, roughly between the 1970s and 2000, uh, we know that by the time we get to 1998 in California and then to 2000 in Arizona and shortly behind that uh, in Massachusetts, that uh, bilingual education has uh, essentially had its heyday, it's been under attack, uh, a lot of the things with the English mo only movement have been successful, and uh, so we now have the imposition of a particular policy that many of us uh, who had worked in the field felt was potentially uh, detrimental to children. If we think about uh, what kinds of policies there are and how to classify these educational policies, uh, you'll have a little more time to reflect on this uh, later online. But uh, uh, essentially the policy in green there, uh, expediency policies are ones which attempt to accommodate minority populations. And uh, Proposition 227 essentially overturned an accommodation policy and replaced it with a restrictive policy, the one in red. Uh, this happened in California, it happened in Arizona, to some degree in Massachusetts, it was attempted in Colorado. But, um, so we have to think, uh, how do, what do we do as researchers and how do we uh, analyze, uh, track, and then try to influence policy when we have a policy that's been implemented that we know is potentially detrimental to children. A lot of the uh, scholars that uh, I worked with uh, at Arizona State University were actively engaged. Uh, some were basically championing being public intellectuals. Uh, many were involved uh, directly in some of the, the struggles. And many of the students themselves uh, had been teachers and uh, had been concerned about what was happening. Uh, one of my former students, who's now an endowed chair at Purdue, Wayne Wright, had been a bilingual teacher in Long Beach and had, had his uh, program dismantled. And that became the incentive for him to go on for a doctorate and then uh, to try to influence the field in different ways. So as I said, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, actually in the field and with schools. Uh, this is a group that uh, went to Window Rock, the Navajo Nation. The Navajo were affected by uh, Proposition 203 in Arizona. And uh, they, they had a bilingual program, and then suddenly they become subject uh, to the same uh, rules that are uh, hitting the rest of the state. 
And uh, ultimately, they got around it by declaring uh, Navajo a foreign language. And uh, so uh, they were able to teach Navajo as a foreign language on the Navajo <laughs> reservation. Okay, so uh, if we think back uh, to the time, this slide is from the period of NCLB when uh, uh, states uh, had to have uh, considerable discretion in what they did. Uh, we decided to basically take the policy itself as a research problem and as a research question. SEI refers to structured English immersion, uh, the, the official name. Uh, in some of the literature, what's called structured English immersion is also called submersion. So uh, the, the actual policy framing and the language becomes one of the issues. But uh, here are a list of uh, questions, all of which are potential research questions. And these become really uh, uh, the type of questions that are involved in policy evaluation and policy impact. Um, the particular angle that uh, I used with a number of my students was to borrow uh, from uh, the uh, areas of social policy analysis. Frequently, in language studies, we, t we kind of uh, cite ourselves and we, we tend to think of uh, frameworks that emerge uh, from language study itself. What was different about this is that uh, we looked at social policy more broadly, uh, particularly uh, the work of Yanao, uh, who's been involved in something called interpretive policy analysis. And we tried to uh, think of ways that uh, interpretive policy analysis could uh, basically be applied to the study of language policy. And um, one, of the, one of the assumptions of interpretive policy analysis is the researcher does not stand in some objective stance totally removed from the situation. It's not like uh, laboratory science uh, where the researcher uh, doesn't have necessarily uh, a direct social stake in what's going on. So it basically assumes that the researcher is a member of the society, that they maybe have a stance in this, and uh, that they have a stake in what's going on. Uh, there are a number of intellectual antecedents for this, uh, and uh, when you have more time, you may want to look up the sources, but I won't try to go into it uh, in detail. Uh, with uh, Sarah Moore, who was one of the students I worked with, uh, we went on later uh, in a fairly recent book that's come out uh, that I would recommend if you're looking for methodologies in language policy. Uh, it's uh, Research Methods uh, in Language Policy and Planning, and it's by Francis Holt, uh, who's at the University of Lund in Sweden. Uh, he worked with Nancy Hornberger and also David Castle Johnson. And uh, this it's basically a, a compendium of different approaches to language policy. Often we think about research over here and we think about language policy over here and then we try to figure out what methods to use, but this uh, represents a kind of synthesis of policies that actually are methodologies that are used uh, in, in policy. So our contribution was uh, to look at how to apply interpretive policy analysis. And uh, one of the things that interp interpretive policy analysis does is that it lets us think of policy over time. Uh, one of the things we were able to do in Arizona by having a series of doctoral students work on a policy as it was being implemented and then as it was being altered over time was uh, to think longitudinally uh, about how the process of policy itself works uh, from the time that it's, uh, it's being intended and uh, when policies are being intended, uh, this is usually, we try to figure out what are the motivations, uh, what are the ideologies that may underlie uh, the policy itself. So there may be an ideological analysis that goes along with that. And then the uh, formulation of the policy itself as formal policy. What does the policy actually say and stipulate by law and by statute? And then during the, uh, the period of implementation, what happens to it? Uh, sometimes policies uh, may, may have uh, something very specific in mind, but during the process of implementation, they may alter and they may change, and they may in fact not get implemented as intended. And then, uh, so what does it look like in practice? How is it experienced by the teachers as, as the agents of the implementation, and how do the students themselves uh, feel about it? 
And then ultimately, uh, how do we evaluate it? And so uh, the dissertations uh, that I refer to here uh, were conducted uh, over roughly an eight-year period as the policy itself was being uh, implemented and then uh, and to some degree being altered uh, uh, as well. So I'm just going to very quickly allude to several uh, dissertations. Uh, the first one was done by Wayne Wright. Uh, this one won the Nabe Award for Outstanding Dissertation. And he used a variety of methods. Uh, we talked about myth methods this morning. And I think uh, it's important sometimes to realize that uh, you may not rely on a single research methodology. But one of the things that uh, Wayne used was interpretive uh, policy analysis, but he also used some rather modernist tools, uh, the concerns-based uh, management uh, tools that are designed to, to look at and evaluate what happens to policy as it's being implemented as an innovation. And so one of the things uh, that Wayne did uh, immediately after his dissertation was go out, follow up with teachers, and try to see how they were interpreting the policy. So he, he continued to write about this, uh, and uh, I, would, I would highly recommend uh, looking up some of his work, uh, basically to, to look at this as a process from how the policy was initially uh, brought forth and then how teachers began to interpret it and try to understand it. Uh, Sarah Moore was working in teacher training. Uh, she was involved in uh, uh, teaching uh, teachers and helping them get certified uh, to use the model of structured um, English immersion. And so she started uh, analyzing from a curricular standpoint what teachers were being asked to learn uh, and evaluating that in terms of what we know from the larger literature about what would be good practice. And so to some degree, there was a discrepancy analysis that she was doing between what we know about good practice and what was actually being done and what teachers were, were uh, being asked to do. Uh, a little bit later, there was a shift in the policy where they decided that uh, they were going to more or less segregate students uh, through uh, a, a pullout of a four-hour block uh, in which the students would be removed from the in regular instruction. And there was a considerable concern uh, about the potential for the implications of segregated instruction, particularly instruction that might be removed from, from strong content instruction, where there was more of an emphasis on skills. So um, uh, Giovanna uh, Grijalva, uh, who was an EDD student and had leadership, uh, decided to focus on school principals. So she also used interpretive policy analysis as well as the CBAM approach and uh, tried to analyze principal stages of concern as the policy itself was being implemented. Seven out of eight principals that uh, she uh, studied all felt that uh, they were being asked to implement potentially damaging policy. So then this raises uh, you know, some kind of ethical issues for us in the field. When uh, we have to be agents of bad policy, what do we do under those circumstances? Uh, the last study uh, was done by uh, Karen uh, Lilly, who is now at uh, Fredonia. And um, she uh, collected uh, a lot of data on the ground. Uh, during this period uh, with uh, my colleague uh, Beatrice Arias, uh, who was at ASU at that time, uh, we worked with Patricia Gondra and uh, we pulled together a team of graduate students uh, from UCLA and from ASU. And uh, we uh, collected uh, over 300 hours of uh, in-classroom observation uh, as well as interviews with teachers to actually look at how they felt that uh, structured English uh, immersion was working in terms of the students. A lot of this work uh, was uh, published. Uh, Jean Garcia was one of the people who contributed to a paper that is, uh, you can find these papers on the UCLA uh, uh, website and uh, uh, we tried basically to pull together a series of studies because uh, as part of the background of what else was going on, uh, the, there were several iterations of the Flores case in, in Arizona, and some of the material that our students were generating 
and that we were looking at was being subpoenaed as part of the uh, Flores case. And uh, the uh, SEI um, policy in Arizona became an important consideration uh, as part of uh, that Supreme Court case. Um, later on, uh, Sarah was able to go back to a number of the people that had done dissertations uh, on Arizona. And uh, we were also, uh, in this collection, able to include uh, the lawyer who had fought the case to the Supreme Court. And so uh, these dissertations and several other studies were brought together in a volume that I would recommend on language policy processes and consequences so that we can actually follow this story of structured English immersion in Arizona over time and, uh, and uh, basically learn from uh, different dimensions of analysis uh, as they occurred as part of the process. A number of other books uh, have come out uh, dealing either with California or Arizona, which uh, I would also uh, recommend. And uh, there's a fairly extensive bibliography that goes along with this. Uh, in addition, there's been a dimension of how these policies affect uh, Native Americans. I'd strongly uh, recommend uh, the work of uh, Teresa McCarty, uh, who was with us at ASU at that time. She's uh, now at UCLA. Uh, and uh, some of the colleagues that she worked with, uh, she did a major study uh, on how uh, identity of Native American youth is affected uh, by uh, either being allowed or not being allowed uh, to try to study and retain uh, native languages among Native Americans. And then there uh, is a kind of broader field of literature that also deals with these issues more in international uh, contexts, particularly uh, the work of uh, Jim Tollefson. Uh, and um, uh, about three years ago, we came out with a, a special issue of Review of Research in Education published by AERA, which uh, again covers uh, both US and international dimensions of this kind of work. So uh, we had to deal with, uh, as I said, with what uh, professionally many of us considered uh, very negative policy, but I think we do see some bright spots now for new research. Uh, I've recently been asked to review a paper uh, that's studying the movement for the uh, seal of biliteracy. So uh, there are a lot of positive things that we can turn our attention to. And then, of course, here in California, you've been successful in reversing 227. And uh, with the promotion of dual language education as a statewide initiative now, there are going to be a lot of opportunities for very positive work. So, uh, you know, it doesn't only have to be on negative uh, things that happen. We can study uh, the good things as well. And so I'd strongly encourage you to, uh, to take a look at some of the bibliography and some of the dissertations and some of the follow-up work that's been done uh, as an example of uh, what you can do and what you can do uh, in a serial fashion over time uh, in order to study the, uh, the implications of policy as it's conceived uh, implemented and then ultimately what's it, what is its impact. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, three incredible presentations with I think lots of thoughtful, um, thoughtful ideas for you to be thinking about in terms of your own research. Um, now I think this would be a good time um, if you have some questions. Um, some comments, but let's start with some questions, and I think we'll take a few of those, and then I'll ask the panelists to uh, go up on the stage and, and begin to answer those. So anyone have a comment or a question? Not yet. Yes. Yeah, I'm Rebecca Berge, and um, a few of you have mentioned Proposition 58 and that success. So that's an example of policy um, leading the way on a positive note. So I'm curious what our thoughts are and what we um, can do with practice and research to support a uh, policy in the right direction. Good question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, here. 
Um, so we often go from research into policy and policy changes. Um, and on the positive side, then there's the policy evaluation. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about policy evaluation and how do we do that? It's an interesting set of kind of examples, especially when I think of it in terms of documents intended, in a sense, to influence policy, right? I mean, Gene's talking about a report. George is talking about, um, I mean, I'm going back to George's question, what, it, what was I giving you a case study of? And for me, it's, it's a case study of how you bring together research that we have a feeling policymakers don't read necessarily in a format that they might be minimal. And I'd love your advice on how you package, in a sense, what the science knows in a format that the policymakers uh, will listen to. And I think Terry's probably got some insight into that as well as, as a researcher on it, right? And an analysis of, uh, of well, where did this idea come from, that that's what we should be doing? Any other questions? Hi, I'm Kim Helmer. Um, my question is, um, sometimes I get confused with the idea of policy. Of just like, I understand when you talk about it at the federal, state, local level, but what about um, how small does policy get? Is it, do I have language policy in my own classroom? So that's what my question is, is kind of the whole span of the definition of policy. Short answer, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think anyone else? If not, we certainly, oh yes, go ahead. Yeah, just one small thing which relates to what Dudley said and it came up yesterday, the idea of packaging the reports or however it's written up or put on YouTube as videos, it came up yesterday with regard to master students and practitioners reading research. And I think there is a very general thing of, you know, how do we package the research to everyone we want to hear it at various levels. Any, anything else? Yes. Thanks, Ryan. I think um, what you just said, Leslie, reminds me of Maricel's comment after the first day was something about the press. I would like to know how we can influence the press with research findings and thereby get some momentum going behind the kinds of policy changes we'd like to see happen. Good. So these are all great questions. Anyone else before? We ask the panelists to respond. One, there's one right here. Uh, Kathy, there, okay, oh, that's okay. Right yeah. Yes. When I hear about the changes now with dual immersion, I think of a couple of questions because one of the issues has to do with the content instruction for mm -hmm. Spanish, for example, and who would be providing that or whatever the language is, if it's Chinese, et cetera. And I think of the wonderful models that have, I've observed abroad in Central and South America where they do bilingual education very well. Okay, all right. I think that we'll probably start there because we certainly have more than 15 minutes worth. Um, there seem to be uh, several people who really wanted to talk about um, how do we present policy in a way that we can ac actually influence, sorry, how can we present research in a way that can actually influence policy makers? Um, and that included um, also how could we influence the press? Um, so if anyone want to start with that? Well, let me begin because uh, let me start with the notion of who, who actually does the research and who does the recommendations. Very different than what George did. The National Academy of Science is an independent body. It is made up of individuals who come together uh, to do the best synthesis and analysis of the science that exists. A study doesn't begin at the academy unless there is a science. So, so you can say it's, it's attempt very clearly to be objectionable, to, uh, to be objective, not objectionable. Sometimes they are, though. Uh, we were, in some cases, perceived in that way. But, uh, but it is an objective national body 
uh, recognized to put forward recommendations that are not nonpartisan. So who makes that recommendation important? That is why uh, Kinji and I worked very hard to get the National Academy to do that study so that, again, who presents that evidence forward is important. Not only how it's packaged, but who is it that uh, is putting it forward. Uh, so I, I just want to sort of make that point, is who does this is as important as to how it's done. Well, and I can speak to the flip side of that, because we were very we were very explicit in the fact we weren't creating research reviews using all the tools of empirical or meta-analysis. We were, we were trying to operate in a very rapidly moving political and, and policy space, so we were doing the best we could by recruiting top people to think as thoughtfully and as quickly as possible through these issues and at every step to try to think who our audience was. And, and our audience ranged from classroom teachers who might be, oh, I, I didn't mention the teaching channel. We have um, a series of videos on the teaching channel, which is the probably widest accessibility for classroom teachers. Everything from that, and you know, I, I didn't talk about the bullet it, it, saying it's nice to have Kinji Hakuta on your side. That's sort of a Hamilton little reference, right? Um, but, um, because he knew, he knew the policy, the players in the states, in, the, in, in California, but around the country, and, and the kinds of conversations that were going on and the kinds of information that would be helpful at the, right, at the particular moments for, particular, for, for particular actionable items. So it was, it was really, it's, it's something that we could use reports like the one that Jean is talking about if they're available, and if not, we had to do the best we could with the people who were in the room, literally, um, to make policy, and just with with ed the broader educational discourse, because the com because the one of the biggest knee jerk reactions with English learners in the Common Core is they can't do this. English learners can't do this, and we very much tried to not in a defense of the Common Core, but again as a as a way to leverage this moment to get people to rethink expectations for English learners, we sort of use that. I mean, when I would talk to, when I talk to district people, I would say our work is about helping to, helping English learners, uh, you know, be, reach the common, succeed in the common core standards, right? But when we talk to teachers, we talk about using the common core standards to sort of, uh, we talked about appropriating the common core standards to try to affect positive educational change that we wanted to affect whether the standards existed or not. So, I mean, it's a complex answer, but there's, there's multiple layers of it, I think. Um, I think there are multiple audiences for dissemination. And so we need to think about uh, different contexts for dissemination. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, commissioned uh, several of us uh, to do white papers uh, apart from the activity that Jean was going on. They set up a language commission uh, and uh, then they did their own report for that. Uh, so uh, at, at the release of uh, another report, the press were invited in. And so uh, one of the things you can do as a strategy is for, for a high profile release is to invite in the press. At the Center for Applied Linguistics, uh, our website is one of the primary uh, uh, vehicles for dissemination. Uh, and we have several uh, levels of information where uh, we may have briefs, we may have white papers, we may have uh, news releases. Uh, and while I was there, we were averaging about 1.5 million hits a year. Uh, and so we know we were reaching a, a fairly wide audience. But uh, I think uh, in seeing uh, the YouTube presentations or TED Talks or other kinds of things, uh, social media is now obviously providing some opportunities uh, that, uh, that are new and uh, can have uh, a much wider reach also. Just a quick response on Proposition 58 and the question about uh, at what level uh, do language policies operate. I'd recommend a book. Uh, it's a little bit dated now, but uh, the late uh, David Corson wrote a book called Language Policies in Schools where he analyzed school practice as a form of implicit policy and uh, has quite a, quite a detailed analysis of uh, the different layers of policy that can happen at schools. So just give a quick answer to that. 
Okay, um, how about following up then on how, um, basically, um, how to do research into policy evaluation? I think that's a nice follow-on of what you've just been talking about. I'll start again. In terms of actually evaluating policy impact, um, much of that is probably done at the behest of the policymakers themselves. So if you can convince policymakers that they passed a the policy, is it working? And in most cases, they'll kind of scratch their head and say, we think so. So okay, so the next step is, why don't you evaluate it? And so in California, the great example of transitional kindergarten. So early childhood for kids, particularly those kids who are poor, who don't speak English, et cetera. So you do a, a state-funded uh, evaluation of the policy. And so you actually, so I think the first step is to convince the policymakers themselves who made the policy and ask the question very respectfully. If you're investing in this, you're, is something going on out there, what is it? And essentially the policymakers themselves on occasion will essentially ask that question. Head Start evaluations, evaluations are examples of policymakers themselves trying to essentially provide the resources to uh, assess the impact of uh, a program or a policy. I was just gonna add one comment. Um, how, how small can a, a policy research be? Um, there's a lot of wonderful studies, and in fact, some are gonna be coming out in the book that um, TERF is publishing with, with doctoral dissertation grantees, um, looking at teacher's agency and the ways in which teachers implement and adapt and in fact nullify policies that have been um, <laughs> foisted on them by perhaps people in, in higher positions who may not really understand or may not really know the, the best ways of, of actually um, implementing practice. So this sort of bottom-up policy uh, planning is, is really critical and may in fact be more powerful in some cases than some of the large-scale um, top-down policy. Um, and, and so definitely worth evaluating and definitely worth thinking about yourselves as someone who is implementing policy and is using agency to adapt it um, in ways that you think would actually be more beneficial to students or whoever it is you're working with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Many funded projects automatically require uh, some form of evaluation as part of the projects. But uh, I think it's uh, good to think about another source of information, uh, which is the students themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned Karen Lilly's study. Uh, one of the things she did uh, in that study was to do a survey of 2,500 students uh, in uh, middle school and secondary education to see what they thought of structured English immersion. And uh, one of uh, her more astounding uh, findings was that in many cases the students themselves didn't even realize they were in a treatment program. And so if they don't even know that they're in something that's special that's supposed to be helping them, uh, that maybe is one indication of uh, you know, some, some issues that need to be dealt with. Jody, I was just okay. going to add on a slightly different but related note on, on the, t the role of the teacher, mm -hmm. um, and that is looping back to Prop 58, because obviously, I mean, I don't really know, it'd be interesting to talk to other panelists, what was going on. I mean, I've talked to Kenji about this. We're suspicious about a 74% rate of a pro-bilingual, if, if, if voters really understood what they're voting on. So I wanna be cautious in the fact that this, was a, that this was a complete sea change in the public's, I do think it was, if nothing else, it was a sea change in how bilingual ed is talked about in, because it, Senator Laura rolled this out as a 21st century economic um, and globalization act, right? So there were some real important changes. But the other cautionary note, which has to do with teachers, is we don't have a bilingual teaching force sufficient to do any sort of major ramping up at this moment, and so this is not like all of a sudden now we're going to have all of these high quality bilingual programs, you know, the question was about content area instruction, and I mean, especially not after having stifled bilingual ed for multiple years in the state. So this is going to be long-term uh, rethinking of how teacher ed programs recruit students. Uh, I was hearing about a teacher ed 
uh, actually in the local area, in, in the Santa Clara, San Jose area, that's actually starting in high school now with a high school teacher preparation initiative to recruit bilingual um, uh, teachers, to have them start thinking about teaching early on. We, we're, our numbers at UC Santa Cruz have gone down in terms of the people seeking our bilingual authorization over the last few years. So this is, this is hard, going to be hard, hard work, even given the change in, in statewide policy. Yeah. I would just note that uh, when 227 was passed, it's quite uh, probable that many people didn't know what they were voting for then as well. So in fact, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, at that time, uh, you know, bilingual ed was being uh, blamed for a number of things, including uh, accelerated dropout rates. And uh, statewide, only 30% of the eligible students for Title VII services were receiving them in California. So even at that time, there was a, there was a teacher shortage. So there has always been a teacher shortage for qualified bilingual teachers. But beyond that, there is generally a problem with teacher preparation and, and adequacy anyway. So these, these are almost perennial uh, challenges, but certainly if you're gonna try to ramp up, how do you ramp up quickly and with quality? And that will be a research area of focus 458. And the only thing I would remind all of us is that we're, we're gonna to wanna to build this on the science. Mm -hmm. So you know, the science basically says this is the kind of workforce we need out there. So those of you who are training teachers, those of you who are doing professional development, this is the kind of workforce that's needed. So let's roll up our sleeves and move in that way because essentially the science now supports that kind of, uh, of workforce. Whether we have it now or not is certainly critical, but where should we be moving? And we should be moving in that direction. Okay, I want to thank our panelists